So I'm very passionate about art, as you know. I adore art. I spend a lot of time learning about art, reading art, looking at art. And last week, I was just glancing through Renaissance painters, glancing through real lesser-known Renaissance painters, hoping that I would find some painter that I wasn't familiar with that I'd enjoy. And it's a bit like... I don't know, it's like when I listen to fucking disco music. Troll and true. Every every genre. Every I always say this, man. We think that you know, music is music was class in the seventies, music was class in the eighties, painting was brilliant in the Renaissance. And it's easy for us to it's easy to say things like that because the fact is cream rises to the top. When you look back at any genre, music, painting, whatever, the best stuff is what survives. And then we can have rose-tinted glasses over an entire era of art. But that's not how art works. Art requires failure in order for success to exist. But the failure is going to get forgotten. So I search through mediocrity and failure, hoping that there's an uncut gem in there that hasn't been found. So while I was doing this, I came across... A kind of an, an, an unremarkable 16th century Italian Renaissance painter called Francesco Bissolo. And nothing about Francesco's work. It's not, it's not bad. It's just, it's, it's background. It's, it's a background painting. It doesn't, it's not a Leonardo. There's no, the soul isn't in there. It's just, it's a fine painting. But I was looking at it and it's just, it's, Two men, two women, and they're holding a child. And then you look at it and you go, right, it's obviously religious. Okay, well, she's Mary. She's Ma- Mary Magdalene. I don't know who the two lads are. And then I look at the name of the painting. It's called The Circumcision of Christ. And then you're like, oh, fuck. It's baby Jesus. And he's about to get circumcised. This painting from the 16th century by Francesco Bissolo is about the circumcision of Christ. And then I'm I'm taken aback because now I'm thinking about Christ, Dick. And the thing is, like, when I was being taught religious education, like, no, Christ's penis doesn't come into it. The, and the, the concept that here's the son of God, but yet when he was a baby, they still cut his foreskin off. And I was like, wow, I'm thinking about Christ, Dick. How strange. How strange, I've, I've never been asked to think about that now, but Francesco Bissolo in the 16th century is like, yeah, here's a painting, and it's the baby Christ about to get circumcised. And then I went, of course he was circumcised. Christ was, was Jewish. You know, he was born a, a, a Jewish person, and Jewish people, circumcision is part of that, of the tradition of Judaism. And I walk away from it then, I walk away from it, again, an unremarkable painting. But like that's a bombshell. You can't you can't just fucking you can't just learn about Christ my entire life and then this cunt Luigi Francesco Bissolo is like telling me about Christ getting circumcised. So I can't leave it alone. And later on in the day, I'm like, I need to find out about Christ getting circumcised now. That's what I need to do with the rest of my day. I need to find out about Christ's circumcision and what it said in the Bible about it and what happened. So I did, and fuck me. It's a little bit of a saga. Um, images of the baby Christ getting circumcised or preparing for circumcision is it's quite frequent in medieval art. And the whole shtick is, is that in early to, to middle medieval times, like relics were a huge thing. Relics were a massive thing. Now a relic is the body part of like a saint or an apostle, or even an item in their clothing, which is kept in a box, and is said to have religious properties, so relics were a fucking huge deal, you'll still have it man, like fucking Whitefriar Church up in Dublin's got the shriveled dried heart of St. Valentine in, in an ornate box, you know, but relics were a big deal, now relics associated with Christ were the biggest deal of all, 
like if if Christ touched something in his life or if he wore a clothes or if anything he was physically associated with, this thing was then passed around as a fucking relic. Like the Holy Grail. Like the wars that were fought trying to search for the Holy Grail. The fucking Crusades. And the Holy Grail was, I think it's the cup that Christ had put his wine or blood into on the first ever Holy Communion. That's the Holy Grail. And the shit that was fucking, that kicked off in the Middle Ages to, to find this Holy Grail. There was the Shroud of fucking Turin. There was supposedly the original piece of the cross. All this stuff, relics associated with Christ himself, were, they, they were commodified. They were very, the most valuable things within medieval European society were relics associated with Christ. But Christ's foreskin kind of presented a unique situation because the thing is with Christ whatever about something he touched right whatever about the Holy Grail or a piece of the cross or the shroud that he was draped in when he died foreskin is his actual body right and you're talking about a religion here which is all about eating his body and drinking his blood through bread so Christ's foreskin was a fucking big deal as a relic okay but it created problems for the Catholic Church because Christ ascended to heaven. So the thing is, right, if Christ died and then magically ascended to heaven, like physically left this earth and went to heaven, then why would he leave a bit of his dick behind? Do you get me? And that was the big discussion. If Christ ascended to heaven, why would he leave? Why then wouldn't the flap of skin from his dick not also fly into heaven and then why are there relics of his foreskin being passed around Europe in the Middle Ages if Christ truly ascended? It created a real problem, right? In fact, there were several foreskins floating around medieval Europe as relics with various people claiming that this is the authentic foreskin of Christ. The most authentic foreskin of Christ would have been in the year 800, Charlemagne, the king of, king of France, claimed that he was visited by an angel in the night who gave him Christ's foreskin. And then Charlemagne gave this foreskin as a gift to Pope Leo III. Now, this is like, like Charlemagne of France and the Pope Leo III, this, these are like billionaires today. Like last week it was Kim Kardashian's birthday. And as a present, Kanye West had a hologram made of her late father giving her a message. And that was the billionaire present. I'm going to make a hologram of your dead dad and he's going to give you a message, Kim. And that's my gift to you because I'm a billionaire and so are you. If this was a thousand years ago, he'd be giving her Christ foreskin. That'd be Kim Kardashian's birthday gift. That's what we're talking about here. The most prized item in the world is the foreskin of a fucking... A dead carpenter from the Iron Age. So Pope Leo's there in 800. And he's like, I've got Christ's foreskin. And fucking King Charlemagne gave it to me. This is the foreskin. But what happens is all these other competing foreskins emerge all over Europe. With different monasteries or different kings saying, no, I've got the real fucking foreskin of Christ. And it created real, created real problems. And I'm talking... I'm talking going on for centuries, like, centuries of problems. In the 12th century, the, the monks of San Giovanni asked Pope Innocent III to try and authenticate their foreskin. He wouldn't do it. On to the 1500s, there was a, a group of monks in France, and they were like, we've got the real fucking foreskin now, buddy, because they claimed that their foreskin was bleeding. So they were rocking up to Pope Clement, in the 1500s gone. We have a, we've got a foreskin of Christ. And it's bleeding. And it, again. Throughout the centuries. It created real problems for the church. Because they're like. It, even, even if. I know you have all these multiple foreskins. But the thing is. This creates real problems for us. Because Christ ascended to fucking heaven. Christ ascended to heaven. So why would he leave his foreskin behind? 
So then eventually, in the 17th century, so this is Charlemagne presents uh, Pope Leo in the 8th century with a foreskin and it takes nearly a thousand years for the fucking Catholic Church to arrive at an answer that they're happy with. So this theologian called Leo Attilius, right, he sat down and had a good think about the foreskin conundrum. And what he basically said was that, lads, all right, there's about 10 foreskins belonging to Christ in different monasteries all around Europe. Here's the crack. None of them are real. None of them. They're all fake. And then people go, why? Why? We can, this is the real foreskin. And he goes, no, they're, I'll tell you why they're fake. Because, and this is real. This is, this is what the Catholic, this is what a theologian said. I'll tell you what happened, lads. Christ ascended into heaven. Therefore, his foreskin went with him. But because the foreskin was detached at birth, because people are going then, all right, okay, so so if, if Christ got his foreskin taken off when he was a baby, but then he died when he was 32, like, when, when did the foreskin ascend into heaven? Did it just lie around earth for 32 years and then fly into fucking space and rejoin his dick? Because that's the thing, that's what you're thinking. When Christ died, did the foreskin rejoin his dick? Up in heaven. And the theologian was like. No. No no no. Here's what happened. Christ died. The foreskin hung around for 32 years on earth. But when Christ died. The foreskin ascended as well. But it became the rings of Saturn. And that was the official Catholic Church position. Christ's foreskin ascended into heaven. And it became the rings of Saturn. And if you're listening to this going, that's a lot of blaspheming you're doing there, blind boy. No, it's not. I'm telling history here. I'm telling history. This is what they said. But of course, like that didn't quieten down the chatter around the the foreskin, around the relic. People weren't just willing to walk away from it now. Because, you know, this is all bullshit. It's like religion is bullshit. Religion, like religion is the, it, it's just power structures. That's all it is. It's shit made up by humans. So, so there's an, an innate fallibility. So when you, when the, when the church, if there's rival foreskins, okay, all around Europe and there's different monasteries that have this relic, think of it from a human point of view. If, if you are the monastery that has the relic that has Christ's foreskin. What does that do to your monastery? What does that do? If if your monastery is in a town, what does that do to the local economy? Relics brought tourism. Relics were of serious economic importance. Like if you've got a decent enough relic, then you know the church will, will fund like the central church will put more funds into your parish. You might get a better... You might get a fucking cathedral. Now you have a bishop. What happens if you've got a bishop? All of a sudden you become a city. Now you have a city. A relic can do that. A relic could do that to a medieval place. It could go from a tiny little... A monastery with a few gaffs... And a few people living around it... To within a few hundred years... Being a city. And a relic could pull in... That type of interest. So this was a big deal. Like in Ireland what we used to do was. We used to have moving statues. So in the early 20th century in Ireland. A lot of school children would claim that a statue of Holy Mary cried or moved. And then the bishops would announce we've got moving statues. And then this would stimulate the economy in Ireland. All this tourism would come in. The world's media would focus on Ireland as. Oh my god their statues are moving. Then we joined the EU. And we replaced moving statues with a low corporate tax rate. So in the religion of, of economics, we'll say, Ireland now, our relic is we you don't have to pay any tax. If you're a multinational corporation, you don't have to pay tax. And then you've got Apple and Pfizer, man. Pfizer down in Cork. You've got Google up in Dublin. Because that's like... That's our relic. That's how important relics were. It's like Ireland's low... Uh, they don't have to pay any tax here. 
it's corporate tax rate of 12%. They're effectively pay, paying less than 1%. And that's the power of a relic. That's what the equivalent of that would have been in medieval times if you had a relic in your monastery. Do you know, literally, the, the church saying your foreskin isn't real, that's not Christ's foreskin. That would be like the EU going to Ireland and saying you're going to have to start taxing the the big multinational companies. The companies that are working in Ireland, uh, that have their corporate headquarters in Ireland because they only have to pay 12% corporation tax or effectively zero corporation tax. Imagine the EU said no more, they have to pay tax. That would be the size of that decision. That's what it would do economically. Except it's about Christ's dick. So now you're left with all these monasteries all over Europe who are like, we have a piece of Christ's body. They're not just going to give that up. They're not going to give that up and go, oh, sorry about that, lads. No, no, no. We don't know whose foreskin this is. All right, I'm just after, after travelling a good distance now to come and see the foreskin. Where is it? It's actually the rings of Saturn. It's actually the rings of Saturn. Yeah, we were wrong about that. And we don't know who owns it. It's, it's old. It's someone's. We don't know who owns it. Like, they're not going to do that. And they didn't do it. Because, like I said, it's economics. It's fucking economics. That decision means that 10 different monasteries, 10 different towns, 10 different local economies now lose value. So the foreskin debate continued on. Until eventually the 20th century started getting very, very embarrassing. Because as society enters modernity, conversations around the relic of a foreskin start start to look more and more fucking ridiculous. So the church then, by the 20th century, the foreskin, you don't even mention the fucking foreskin. If a monastery mentioned or claimed they had a foreskin, it was, you, they were threatened with excommunication. And most of the foreskins were destroyed. But the one foreskin that they, that they always felt, no, this is the real one, the one going back to 800 that King Charlemagne gave to Pope Leo on the 800th birthday of Christ. That was the one where they're like, no, this is the real one. But the church were mad, embarrassed about it. So this foreskin, the fucking Pope Leo Charlemagne one, this ended up, right, in this this little weird small village in Italy called Calcutta. And Calcutta is strange because all the houses, it's, it's beautiful looking, all the houses in Calcutta are like built like almost like medieval skyscrapers on the side of a cliff. Okay, it's it's a weird looking place. And the foreskin ended up there. And of course, Calcutta then saw quite a lot of tourism because people are coming to visit this foreskin relic in Calcutta. But in the in like the, I think the 1950s or something like no, the 1930s people started to not live in Calcutta anymore because the buildings were on the side of these cliffs and it was deemed as unsafe to live. Buildings were falling down, right? So people stopped visiting there and people stopped living in there, but the foreskin was still there. And then even stranger, a lot of hippies. So Calcutta now is like a hippie commune. For some reason, all these hippies, like 1960s hippies, started turning up to Calcutta and starting hippie communes there this place where the fucking foreskin is but anyway sometime sometime around so, sometime in the 20th century the, the local priest in Calcutta who would have been the custodian of the original foreskin it was, the foreskin was getting too hot and the church were threatening him with excommunication so he had the foreskin hidden in a shoebox in his own house and then and this is the big conspiracy. In fucking ninth in 1983, somebody broke into that that priest's house. Father Ma- Man- Mangoni broke into his house and stole the foreskin. Right? And finally the foreskin disappeared. And the priest had to publicly declare, lads, I'm not gonna display the holy relic of Christ's foreskin anymore. I can't it was robbed. It was robbed from my house. It's gone. And the church were like, finally, the rest of the foot, we'd managed to get rid of all the other foreskins. They've been destroyed. Centuries of work. The last one is fucking gone. 
And then this bishop, right? A bishop on his fucking deathbed. A bishop on his deathbed in Italy kind of gave a few hints that it was the it was the church, it was the fucking Vatican. The Vatican sent secret agents to this Italian priest's home in Calcutta and they stole the foreskin. And the foreskin is hidden away in the Vatican vaults as this really embarrassing relic. And the real foreskin is the rings of Saturn. Still, I don't know. I don't know what their position on that is. You know, have they rolled that back? Because that theologian said it in the 17th century that the foreskin is is the rings of Saturn. Have they rolled that back? I don't know. (laughs) Freudian slip. Rolled it back. Fucking hell. But that business of Christ's foreskin got me thinking about value. Because, you know, usually something is valuable when it's scarce. And what could be more scarce than the foreskin of Christ? Like, there's all, there's definitely only one. But when people started counterfeiting the foreskin of Christ, then it kind of loses value because you don't know which is which. And then the more foreskins that get created, then the less value that Christ's foreskin has. But sometimes society can ascribe value to an object or to a thing and it isn't because of scarcity. It's like we as a society can create a myth around this thing and this mythology can increase its value like a shared lie. And I'm going to I'm going to speak about two different things and they're both connected via shellfish. The first thing I want to speak about is lobsters. And then what I'm going to speak about is the color purple, which are both connected by sel- shellfish. Lobsters is a blatant one because that is shellfish. But when you think of lobsters, like lobsters are really, really expensive, posh food. Like lobsters genuinely quite expensive. And not only is it expensive, we associate it with fancy restaurants. Lobster to be eaten with champagne, we'll say. Lobster is an exclusive food. If you're ordering lobster be prepared to pay a lot of money. So how did this happen? How did lobster become a fancy expensive food? Because the thing is, it wasn't always that way. And what's interesting about this story is the Irish are very heavily involved in this. I'm always speaking about the Irish cultural footprint. Because we've had to travel the world to get away from the conditions at home that were created by colonisation... The Irish footprint. There's Irish people in every fucking story that I look for. There's always Irish people involved. And I ended up down this particular rabbit hole when I was I was researching Irish indentured servants in America in the 1600s. A lot of Irish people were forcibly sent to the Caribbean and Barbados as indentured servants. Effectively... People who were forced to work, forced labour, but they were indentured, which meant that they were forced to work for a certain amount of time, and then once that time was up, they were free. Which is why it's very important to never compare this situation to chattel slavery, where a person was owned in perpetuity, and their children were owned, and were never free, and bolstered by a system of racism. This is why you can't compare the, the Irish experience of indentured servitude with chattel slavery and fuck anyone who tries to do that so this experience of indentured servitude happened to quite a lot of Irish people in the 1600s in Barbados at the hands of the British and what I wanted to find out more about is did the English just send the Irish indentured servants just to Barbados did they send them anywhere else well it turns out in the 1600s quite a lot of Irish indentured servants went to North America what became North America, specifically in the English colony of Massachusetts in North America in the 1600s. So, America um, was quote-unquote discovered. I don't like to use that word, it wasn't discovered. America was colonised and stolen from 
the indigenous Native American people. And this was done by the British, the Spanish, the Portuguese and the French, of course, the quote unquote great nations of Europe. So North America, Massachusetts, which is now like Boston. The British set up colonies there. And this was obviously, this was a dangerous business. All right. Massachusetts is is a very long distance from England. So it took a long time on a ship to get there. And when the colonizers set up colonies, it was tough to survive there. So what the colonists needed was labor, essentially. They needed free labor in order for the colonies to work for them. And in the 1600s, a lot of this labor was Irish indentured servants. But the Irish that were sent to Massachusetts, they weren't forcibly sent like they did in Barbados. A lot of the Irish indentured servants that ended up in Massachusetts did so voluntarily. They were known as redemptioners. So Ireland in the 1600s wasn't a lot of crack. Ireland was being brutally colonised by the English. Um, It was just before the penal laws were about to set in. So quite a lot of Irish wanted to get the fuck out of Ireland. So the redemptioners became a group of Irish, very, very poor Irish Catholics who wanted to travel to the colonies in North America. But they didn't have any money, obviously. And the colonists that were going to America in the 1600s, to the the English colonists, they were Protestant Puritans. They were Protestants and they had money. They had the money to travel there. So these Irish people were like, okay, how can I get to America? And the English were like, you can do it if you become an indentured servant. So we will pay for your passage to America, but you must work off that money for a period of between seven to ten years. So all of a sudden, the colonies of Mass- in Massachusetts, the Massachusetts Bay Colony, start filling with Irish indentured servants who do all the labour and are spending about ten years in not slavery but slave-like conditions in order to work off their journey. Now, as you can imagine, they were absolutely hated. They were at the the bottom of the society within the colony. Now, the colony, you have to remember, would have been like, like a walled commune. And everything outside of that would have been indigenous Americans. So within the colony, the Irish indentured servants were treated quite terribly. And they were also Catholics, which means they were hated by the Protestant Puritans and the Ulster Scots. But as I'm reading about this, what keeps propping up is lobsters, right? Because the thing is, the English people who owned the Irish indentured servants had to feed them. And they didn't want to feed them vegetables or lamb or pigs or whatever it was they were raising to feed themselves. They wanted to give them the cheapest possible available food. And that food in Massachusetts was lobsters. Lobsters had been used by the Native Americans as fertilizer. Lobsters in Massachusetts in the 1600s were so abundant that they were washing up on the shore in piles that were two foot high. And the lobsters back then were massive. They were the size of small dogs. And... The English colonists hated lobsters. They didn't consider lobster to be food. Even the name lobster comes from an Anglo-Saxon word that means spider. The English colonists considered lobsters to be giant insects from the sea, which they are. They're, They're giant insects, just sea insects. And they weren't considered food or edible. And the only time that the English colonists would eat lobsters is when they had to. Because life on the colonies was it was difficult. It was really difficult. But lobster soon became the food that was given to Irish indentured servants in Massachusetts. So it became a food associated only with the poorest of the poor. And it was a shameful and embarrassing food culturally at that time. Because there was loads of it and it was washing up on the beaches. There's a quote from the from the colony at the time that says that lobster shells about a house are looked upon as signs of poverty and degradation. The Irish were being fed so much lobster 
in the Massachusetts Bay Colony that it caused a fucking rebellion, right? And it forced the English to agree that indentured servants could only be fed lobster at no more than three times a week. Now, the thing is with lobster, I I don't eat shellfish, but people who eat lobster say that it's absolutely delicious, all right? Most people say it's absolutely fantastic. So there are theories that the reason one of the... Not only was lobster considered a really poor, shameful food in the 1600s in Massachusetts, it was considered disgusting. And they say that's probably because they were eating dead lobsters. So they were picking these lobsters up off, up off the beach and then cooking them. At some point, someone figured out if you catch the lobster live and then cook it fresh, then it becomes tasty. But that wasn't the case back then. So how does this food, of which there was fucking loads in Massachusetts, which was this embarrassing food that was only fed to indentured servants, which was a signifier of poverty, how does that go f- go from that to becoming one of the most expensive things that you can buy in a restaurant that we now consider to be incredibly posh food well it's a uniquely kind of american capitalist advertising type thing so what happens is the massachusetts bay colony of the 1600s that was an english colony right the country of the united states didn't exist uh when the united states became a country through the revolutionary war with england and and the united states became a country and started to expand over the entire expanse of what you call the US and different cities and towns started to set up. We're talking the 1800s, we'll say. Railways started to be invented to connect the various parts of the United States. And the thing is with railways, if you can afford to get on a train across the United States, you probably have a few quid in your pocket. So the emerging middle class and the pre-existing upper class of Americans are now able to travel around the United States via railways in the 1800s. And the thing with railways or trains at the time, it was kind of posh and you had the posh dining cart, which was a fine dining experience for rich people. And the lads who were running the train companies were trying to figure out a way that they could save money. How, How can I feed these rich people charge them loads of money and not spend a lot of money while doing it and they figured out the answer was lobster because lobster was this shameful abundant poverty food in Massachusetts but not in the Midwest not in California so what happened is railway companies started to create like surf and turf so what was considered exclusive and expensive was steak. So they were like, okay, we've got steak and then we have this lobster stuff, which when you prepare it fresh, when you cook it uh, fresh and serve it with butter is actually really, really delicious. So let's start serving surf and turf on trains to rich people. Here's half a bit of steak and here's this stuff called lobster with butter. And when you put the steak beside the lobster, the lobster starts to, through kind of weird osmosis, achieve the same cultural value that steak has. And lobster's really tasty as well. So the railroads of the United States, via fancy dining carts, basically manufactured lobster as this incredibly posh food that you eat with steak and butter. And you serve it to people who are travelling everywhere getting off trains and talking about it and then lobster as an expensive posh fancy thing was born and the other thing they did too is like lobster still wasn't scarce there was loads of lobster it wasn't expensive to procure for the people running the trains now beef at the time yes that was exclusive beef in the 1800s like raising a beef cow requires a lot of resources it requires time it requires land it requires water it requires a huge amount of grain and food so beef at the time was scarce and therefore there was a reason for it being expensive beef now i've mentioned it before beef now is is completely unsustainable 
we've created an unsustainable system whereby beef should be expensive and it's not but we're over exploiting that resource through massive farms and destroying the planet because of beef but beef used to be exclusive like gold for a reason it was hard to get and difficult to make lobster wasn't it was simply placed alongside steak but what they also had to do with lobster is there this strange thing with food and its perceived value and the level of cruelty that goes into its preparation Um, it's an odd thing so if you think of foods that are considered posh foie gras foie gras is just just to let you know uh, for the next four minutes I'm going to speak about food preparation methods that are quite cruel to animals if you'd rather not hear you can skip ahead about four minutes so foie gras is a very expensive exclusive posh French food it's a bit like pate and what it is is the over fattened liver of a goose that has spent its entire life in a state of torture basically what they do is they get geese and they they force feed the goose grain until the goose gets so fat that it can't move it has to be kind of clamped down and this overfeeding causes the goose's liver to become incredibly fat and then the liver is extracted and served up as this really fat delicacy that's what foie gras is and part of its exclusivity is that the person eating it understands and knows that the animal has been through a ritual of suffering in order for the consumer's pleasure to occur veal is another example veal is calves that aren't allowed see any light at any point of their lives they're kept in the dark and then all the blood is drained from their body young calves veal for the same reason the ritualistic suffering of the animal enhances the pleasure and exclusivity of the food the the poshest food that i can possibly think of the poshest most exclusive food which most people are probably only hearing about now that i mention it is known as artelan and artelan is now actually illegal like you, you i don't think you can legally even get artelan at a restaurant because it's been made illegal for being so cruel and fucked up so what artelan is again it's french so and and it's all about ritual and cruelty and only the richest of the rich at the finest restaurants can eat artelan the artelan is this really tiny bird it's a songbird from Africa and it flies all around Europe and basically what the French did with the artelan is they catch an artelan tiny tiny bird and they keep it in a dark cage and the psychological torture of keeping the bird in a dark cage the kind of abuse of that causes the little bird to gorge itself on figs and grain it basically overeats it's so upset at its conditions that it just eats and eats and eats so then they get the artelan and they drown it alive in brandy and then it's plucked and fried and when artelan is served in a restaurant to whoever can fucking afford it now if you've seen the hbo series succession which is fantastic if you've seen that series this visual that I'm about to describe might make sense to you and this is a long tradition this is this is the mad thing about artelan right it's this tiny crispy bird smaller about the size of a plum the person eating it at a restaurant has to place a, a like a napkin over their head like known as an artelan veil so the person sits down with their little artelan on a plate places this weird white fucking napkin over their heads so no one can see them eating and then they eat this bird whole in private with the napkin over your head in the restaurant and it's because there's there's no hardly any meat on the bones you're basically eating this crunchy bag of bird bones and the purpose of the veil is that to stop the bones flying everywhere but also this is so exclusive and so such a delicacy that you need to wear the veil over your head 
to concentrate every one of your senses only on eating this little bird and to keep all the smells there. So that's Artland. That's the poshest food on the fucking planet. The most expensive food you can get. It's now illegal in France. And I'm guessing people still eat it. And the only way to eat it is to get a private chef to agree to make it. But what you have there... The value and scarcity of it is created around ritual and suffering. And lobster is quite similar now. When you think of eating lobster at a restaurant... We know that there's no hassle getting lobsters. There's no shortage of fucking lobsters. But when you go to a restaurant, the the scarcity is manufactured. The lobster is contained in a tank, alive. And often you pick the lobster that's alive that you want. And then you know that that lobster is boiled alive to suffer for your pleasure. And then it's brought out to your plate. So the scarcity and suffering is manufactured to then justify the price of the lobster and I just it's so fucking absurd and it makes me think like in the 1800s when lobster was first being served on these American trains to rich people alongside steak like if an Irish person whose parents maybe were indentured servants had heard about it if they had if they were in Boston how they'd laugh to think that these rich people were paying for lobster and it reminds me of um, a buddy of mine from Limerick he's he's got a Spanish wife and they were in the, the Limerick market the milk market in Limerick which is where if you're in Limerick you can buy fancy foods so they were there in the Limerick milk market which, which was not posh when I was growing up when I was growing up the Limerick milk market is where your dad went to buy stolen power tools but now it's like the English market down in Cork it's where you get fancy food and there was an olive stand and these olives in the Limerick market are quite expensive you know a punnet of them might be a fiver and my friend's Spanish wife just started roaring laughing at the fiver for the punnet of olives and he's like what are you laughing at and she's like I fucking know the farmer who makes those olives like they're not even good olives back home in Spain we wouldn't even eat them. And and over here in Limerick, you're fucking charging five quid upon it. And she thought this was hilarious. That was a bit of an olive tangent there, but it's an example of the, the manufacture of value around foods. And when I spoke earlier and I mentioned how America was colonised by quote-unquote the great nations of Europe and how these great nations asserted their greatness through monarchy and royalty, this manufactured entitlement like monarchy is just bullshit like that's just fucking bullshit monarchy is we took a place for by force a thousand years ago and ever since have created ever more elaborate rituals to create status and a huge thing around the creation of monarchy in western europe in france spain uh britain portugal something that's associated with royalty is the colour purple so I want to speak about where the colour purple came from how the colour purple came to be associated with royalty and why it has very humble origins in shellfish purple is the colour of luxury the colour of regality if you think of brands that try and make themselves look fancy like fucking Cadbury's milk tray you look at the branding of Cadbury's milk tray or dairy milk they very consciously use the colour purple to make us think that this product is exclusive and fancy how did this happen how did society decide that purple is the colour of exclusivity so you have to remember what colours and pigments throughout history like Paints weren't just lying around. Dyes weren't just lying around. Well, they were, but getting a colour to stick to something via paint or to dye a fabric took years and years of technology and early chemistry to figure out how to do it. So in the ancient world, people didn't have a full palette of colour. 
Like, I spoke about this before with the ancient Greeks. Like, they analysed ancient Greek poetry, in in specific Homer's Odyssey, which would be, I think, about 2,000 years old. I could be off. But anyway, someone noticed. It was actually William Gladstone, who ended up being a Prime Minister of England. They noticed that in ancient Greek poetry and in Homer's Odyssey, no one ever mentions the colour blue. When he talks about the sea... He says it's like the colour of dark wine. And people looked into it more and more and they're like, fuck it. No one said, no, no, they didn't have a word for blue in ancient Greece. What the fuck is that about? And there's this theory that the thing in, in ancient Greece, in that area at the time, the only things that were blue were the sky and the sea. So because of that, people didn't have a word for blue and some argue that people because the 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 fucking sky and the sea were the only things that were blue and and a word didn't exist for it people didn't see the color blue back in the times of ancient greece because why would you why would you why would you need a color for something when you don't have a variety of things that are this cover color and i know that's very difficult for us to think of today to imagine a world where there's a poverty of colour, but that was the case. They didn't. The Greeks didn't have a word for blue, because they didn't need it. The only thing that was blue was the sky or the sea. They didn't need a word for the colour. The Egyptians did have a word for blue because they'd figured out how to make blue dye. And I know that sounds bizarre, but in 2006, uh, scientists were like fucking hell, we got to test this out. Is it is it possible that because the ancient Greeks didn't have blue in their world and they didn't have a word for it, that maybe they didn't actually even see blue? So in 2006, Goldsmiths University did this study where they found a tribe from Namibia called the Himba tribe. And the, the Himba tribe don't have a word for blue in their language. So they got members of this tribe and showed them screens with different dots of green and different dots of blue and people in the tribe couldn't see the dots that were fucking blue because they didn't have a word for it all right so it's i did a podcast on this before one of my earliest podcasts that's why i'm not going into great detail with it but it's mind-blowing but the ancient greeks did figure out how to manufacture a dye for the color purple right i think it was even before the ancient greeks the phoenicians which were like the, the earliest Greek civilization, 2,500 years BC, before Christ. So that's almost 4,000 years ago, if not more. I'm shit at maths. Some even think that the, the name Phoenicia for the Phoenician civilization means purple land because the Phoenicians had figured out how to make this purple dye and to dye their clothes and to paint things the color purple, which... If you came from a civilization that didn't know how to do this, you're like, holy fuck, they have this color there in Phoenicia, you gotta see it. So they named the Phoenicians after this color. So we now know this specific color purple is, it's called Tyrian purple. And it's one of the most important colors in all of human history. And Tyrian purple, which the ancient Greeks used, is the reason that purple is strongly associated with royalty all throughout Western history. And This colour purple comes from a type of crustacean, a sea snail, that's a cousin of the lobster, uh, called the Murex snail, which used to wash up on the beaches of ancient Greece. And it specifically comes from the arsehole of this very spiny Murex snail. And this colour purple, Tyrian purple, which the Greeks discovered was so important that its discovery even made its way into Greek mythology. The the story in Greek mythology of how the Greeks or the Phoenicians discovered Tyrian purple from this snail, the story goes that like um, there's a Greek god called Heracles, right? In he's Hercules in in Roman mythology because Roman the Romans took some of their gods from the Greeks, so the Greeks called him Heracles and then the Romans called him Hercules. So here's the story in Greek mythology. Heracles, who's this heroic god, he's, the, he's one of the sons of Zeus. Heracles is walking along the beach in Greece 
and he has his dog with him. And Heracles is on his way to ride a nymph. A nymph in Greek mythology, nymphs for like, they were beautiful female, they weren't goddesses, they were like fairies. They were f- very, very physically attractive um, creatures of nature that, that took the form of beautiful women. It's where you get the phrase nymphomaniac from. The, the nymphs in Greek mythology were f- woman fairies who were just mad for riding all the time. So Heracles anyway is like walking along the beach going, I'm going to fuck a nymph. Brilliant. And he's thrilled with himself walking along the beach ready to have sex with a nymph that he's going to meet up in the woods. And he's got his dog with him. And while they're going along the beach and Heracles has got the horn for the nymph, his dog stops on the beach and starts devouring the arsehole of a one of these murex snails that's on the beach. So the dog is there messing around with the snail. And then Heracles goes over and says, what the fuck are you doing? I'm supposed to be getting my ride off a nymph up in the mountains and you're down here eating a snail's arse. What are you at? And he starts giving out to the dog. So the dog anyway runs away with Heracles. He's after getting scolded for wasting time eating a snail's arse. So by the time Heracles and his dog arrive up at where the nymph is, Heracles is there to the nymph going, right, I'm here, brilliant, can we have sex? And the nymph then looks at the dog's mouth and she's like, what the fuck's up with your dog's mouth? And then Heracles is like, I don't know, he was eating a fucking snail's arse down by the beach. And the nymph notices that all along the dog's mouth is this wonderful colour that she's never seen before. And this colour is purple. And she says to Heracles, I'm not having sex with you until you come back to me with a a dress or a garment that's the exact same as the colour that's all around your dog's mouth. So Heracles is like, fuck, what am I going to do? I want to have sex with this nymph. So Heracles goes back down to the beach and figures out that there's some extraction from this sea snail's arse that creates the colour that's around his dog's mouth. And that's how Tyrian purple was born. And that's the Greek mythology birth story of the colour purple. Heracles wanted to have sex with someone. His dog ate a snail's arse and then... In the time it took for his dog to leave the beach and go to the nymph's fucking house, his mouth was purple and she wanted a dress made out of that colour. And that's the story in Greek mythology where purple came from. But in real life, what happened was someone in this area around what we call Phoenicia, I think it might have even been near Lebanon, um, somewhere around this area, the people figured out these particular snails, these murex snails, have something going on around their arses that creates this colour purple and we can extract this by catching loads of these snails and we can dye fabrics with this incredibly bright, unique colour. And in the ancient world, there was nothing like it. There was no other dye that could change the colour of a fabric as significantly as Tyrian purple. And in a world where you don't have a colour palette, where most people are wearing clothes that are just the colour of the fibres they're made from, all of a sudden the Greeks were like, we can make these fucking capes out of this colour called Tyrian purple. This is important shit. This is the height of technology. So what started to happen was, the ancient Greeks started to tightly control who could and couldn't wear this colour purple. They had to make it exclusive. They had to make it something that they could trade. So the only people who were allowed wear clothes that were coloured with Tyrian purple were very, very rich people. People of very high social, uh, political rank or, or religious. And peasants weren't allowed to wear anything that had this Tyrian purple. And, and this was taken really seriously. And the Romans adopted it too because... Like the Romans came after the ancient Greeks, but the Romans adopted a hell of a lot of their society and customs from the Greeks. They modelled themselves on the Greeks. And there was this fella called Ptolemy. Now, not Pot- I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. Not Ptolemy who made the maps. A different Ptolemy. He was a king of Mauritania, right? But this Ptolemy 
went to visit Emperor Caligula. Now Caligula was a bit of a prick. He was the fella that was a, he was a really violent fucker and used to have all these big orgies and stuff. Caligula was a mad bastard. But anyway, Ptolemy goes to visit Caligula. And when Ptolemy came to visit Caligula, and this is real life now, this is historical, it's not myth. Ptolemy decided to wear his entire clothes with this Tyrian purple, right? Head to toe, this really dark purple. And Caligula basically was like, if well, Ptolemy's after turning up here in all purple. That's him trying to say that he's better than me. And Caligula had him killed. So Ptolemy lost his life because he chose to meet Caligula entirely draped in Tyrian purple. So this is how much of a strong, exclusive statement this was and how this purple was valued as the colour of royalty. And of course then, Western, we'll say, Western civilization, the, the, the monarchies, the great nations of Europe that form after the collapse of the Roman Empire, they then start to borrow these classical ideas and borrow the importance of the colour purple. And if you look at the paintings of like, you'll see it in some of Michelangelo's frescoes. When, when Michelangelo was portraying Christ, he'd often have Christ in, in a purple robe to show the importance of Christ. Now, there's the other, I did another podcast on the colour blue. So the difference between the exclusivity of blue and the exclusivity of purple is that if you look at historical paintings from the Renaissance or whatever, Holy Mary is always painted in blue. Now, the thing with blue, blue was actually exclusive. The colour blue in the Middle Ages came from a, a precious stone called lapis lazuli and this was actually hard to find and it was really expensive. So that's why Holy Mary is blue because if an artist was using blue, an artist, a painter was showing off, look how rich I am, look, look how wealthy I am, I have access to the colour blue. So blue is exclusive because it's literally, or blue has status because to have blue is literally exclusive but the exclusivity and status of purple is completely manufactured because purple comes from the arse of a fucking snail that you can get on the beach. It's it's like lobster. There's plenty of lobster washing up on the beach. There's no scarcity going on here. Society decided that lobster was posh. Society also decided that purple was posh, that Tyrian purple was posh. There was no scarcity there. So this is how deep colour of purple came to be associated with royalty and regality. It goes back to the ancient Greeks but the origin story is fucking ridiculous. It's a snail's arse. You know what I mean? It's fucking absurd. And one psychological reason that they say why this, this colour was so valued is royalty is nothing but extreme violence. All right, Royalty is one of the most fucked up constructs of society. Royalty is some very, very violent people decide to take an area by force and commit acts of obscene violence. And in order to take this area, they need to convince everybody there that they're really, really special and that their heirs and children and children's children should have that same level of entitlement. So they manufacture ritual around it. And the reason this deep shade of purple was so appealing to royalty is that it was a signifier of the, the violence that was required to take the land by force. They wanted a purple that looked like clotted human blood, that looked like the, the deep, deep purple that human blood achieves when someone is slaughtered. And that is what the regal that's where royalty, purple for royalty initially, and, and the Greeks and the Romans was like, this is the blood of my enemies. It's not red because when you really fucking slice someone open and that blood congeals, it's a deep purple like my cloak and that's why I'm entitled to this land. It's fear and power and beauty. And if you want to go one step further and get really fucked up with it and look at, okay, we've established that Tyrian purple, going back to the ancient Greeks, is co-opted by the Romans, is co-opted by the monarchical nations of Europe to signify royalty and entitlement and power. The phrase blue-blooded also has its roots in this 
Tyrian purple and the fact that it looks like blood. So in Spain, uh, Spain used to be ruled by the Moors, by Islam. Spain for about 800 years was an Islamic country in the early Middle Ages, right? And Spain went through a period called the Reconquista where the monarchy of Spain reconquested their land. They took back the land from the Moors who were people who were North African and these people would have had dark skin. So the Spanish came up with this, Spanish royalty came up with this phrase sangre azul which means blue blood and basically what they're saying is white skin. They started to associate their white skin with an entitlement and a sense of purity with royalty. So even though they're using the word blue they're referring to purpleness and royalty and what they mean is their skin was so white that they could see the purple veins in their hands. So the Spanish manufactured this concept of if your skin is so white that you can see the purple blood running through the veins of your arm then that's royalty in your blood and you're entitled to this land and differentiated themselves from the darker skinned Moors who had previously been ruling Spain under Islam. So now more than a thousand years, two thousand years later from when Heracles is on the beach with his dog eating a snail's arse and purpleness becomes associated with royalty and regality. Now the Spanish claim that they can see it in their fucking veins and in particular, like you'll see it in the, the patron saint of Spain is called Saint James. Now his full title is Saint James Matamoros which literally means Saint James the Slayer of Moors. And if you look at images of the Spanish Saint James, the patron saint, often the image is a, a pure white skinned Saint James on horseback beheading an African, a North African Moor, while Saint James raises his, his sword in the air and you can see his exposed wrist and the, the blue or purple veins on his wrist. And this, it's this entitlement and this sense of monarchy and conquest and entitlement to land that then leads to the conquest of America. Because I started this by talking about the quote-unquote great nations of Europe that colonised America, Spain, France, Portugal, Britain. And they have their purpleness and their regality and their royalty and their blue-bloodedness and using this as... Sure, of course, America is ours. I don't give a fuck about who's living there. We're entitled to this. We're regal. We're royal. And the great irony of how you can take it full circle and it, it goes to fucking lobsters. It goes to sea crustaceans. The purpleness, the blue blood. It's a fucking snail's arse in a beach and in, in ancient Greece, man. You know? It's a dog eating a snail's arse on a beach and then his lips go all purple. What the fuck is so posh about that? What's so fancy and royal about that? You silly cunt. And then you've the, the colonizers in Mass Massachusetts taking the land from Native Americans, filling it up with Irish indentured servants and considering the, you know, the lobster, the cousin of this purple arse snail, considering this to be food for the peasants and all of a sudden then it becomes the poshest food in the world. It's all manufactured. It's manufactured around ritual. And I suppose what I'm trying to get around this is I'm trying to highlight the absurdity of status and value around certain things and status, value and entitlement. Whether it be the lobster served alongside steak or the colour purple somehow signifying royalty which then gets perverted into the, into the idea that it runs through the veins of royal people it's all manufactured and it just it's just there to serve entitlement and evil essentially because you always get this this idea some people say if some if when people are defending colonization they say sure fuck it you were colonized 
But if you weren't colonised, you'd have colonised somewhere, someone else. And sometimes I think not, not necessarily. Not if the culture doesn't have a culture of entitlement. And it always takes me back to the voyage of St. Brendan. St. Brendan was this semi-mythical but also real Irish monk in, I think, around the 5th century. I'm going to say 5th century. It was, it was after the collapse of the Roman Empire in Britain. And Ireland was having a little bit of a golden age and we hadn't been colonised yet. But St. Brendan was this saint who was also a sailor. He was Brendan the Navigator. Now, half his story is myth and half his story is real. He was definitely a person and he definitely got on a boat and he sailed on a fantastic journey, right? And there is evidence to suggest that that St. Brendan from Ireland in the 5th century reached North America or Canada long before anyone else did. And what always strikes me about the story of St. Brendan, because I read it a lot and I got a good translation of it recently. One thing that always strikes me about the voyage of St. Brendan, he got up as far as Iceland. He very possibly got to North America. But when he's with his sailors, one thing that St. Brendan says all the time to the sailors is, when we sail and we arrive on a new island, don't ever steal from that island. Don't steal from that island and don't commit acts of violence against the people that are there. Because if you do, we won't be safe at sea. Only by going around the Atlantic and finding these islands and visiting them. Only when we do it with respect are we watched over by God on our journey. But as soon as you steal something from one of these islands or you hurt someone on these islands, then the wrath of God and Christ will come upon you and our boat will sink and we'll drown. And I'm not I'm not using that as like an explicit example of, well, if the Irish had a chance, we would have never have colonised because you can look at Irish history going back a thousand years and there's evidence of the Irish raiding parts of Britain, you know. But I just find it interesting that St. Brendan managed to sail all around the Atlantic, maybe reached America, and he explicitly stated do you know what, lads? It's possible to go to a new land and not think that it's yours. I just find that interesting. I find it very interesting that he had that concept. He didn't go there and go, brilliant, there's some shit we can take. I better tell the lads back home and we'll all head off there and take everything. He was like, no, respect the people that are there, say what's the crack, and then head home, go back to your monastery. <laughs> 